All right. Now we turn to the Kirtland Temple dedication and the Kirtland Endowment. This is delicious stuff. So, uh, hope you're hungry. Let's talk context. So the Kirtland Temple is now uh, fully built uh, all the way and the <coughs> dedication has been set. If you look at the date, section 109, what's the date there? March 27th, so dedication day, March 27th. The Lord had promised that if they would build this temple, they would receive an endowment, an endowment of power from on high. What was that? Look at the promises. You, you, you'll remember these, but let me just put them all together in one spot for you so that it becomes more powerful. Section 38, remember that was the original promise. Uh, if you will go to the Ohio, then I will endow you with power from on high. Uh, verse uh, 40, uh, section 43, verse 16. Sanctify yourselves, he said to those in Kirtland, and ye shall be endowed with power from on high, which ye may give, even as I have spoken. Uh, that was back in 31. These are both 31 months apart from each other. Then in 33, uh, two years later, section 95. Verily I say unto you, I give unto you a commandment that you should build a house, in the which house I design to endow those whom I have chosen with power from on high. What's he talking about? Clearly associated with the Kirtland Temple. Amen. Uh, wait, there's more. Uh, Fishing River, Missouri, when they found out that they couldn't go in and fight, that they couldn't help their brethren be reinstalled in the land of Missouri, at the kind of fizzled end of Zion's camp, the Lord said in that section that the redemption of Zion cannot be brought to pass until my elders are endowed with power from on high. For behold, I prepared a great endowment, a blessing to be poured out upon them inasmuch as they are faithful and continue in humility before me. Verily I say unto you, it's expedient to me that the first elders of my church should receive their endowment from on high in my house, which I have commanded to be built unto my name in the land of Kirtland. He is specifically talking about the Kirtland Temple, true? Why am I making a big deal about that? Is the endowment in the Kirtland Temple anything like the modern endowment? No, in fact, just forget that you know anything about modern endowment, otherwise that continually collides with and uh, gets makes this get muddled. So I would just just go transport yourself back to this day with childlike wonder, ponder what could the Lord mean by this. And then as we look at the evidence to see what it actually was, uh, we can actually we can enjoy this and not have it beaten up against Nauvoo endowment kind of stuff. Because that comes later. The Kirtland Endowment is basically four things. So it is divine teaching. It is ordinances. Which ordinances? These ones. Washing, anointing with oil, sealing the anointing, and washing the feet. Those were the ordinances they were doing in the Kirtland Temple. And then uh, the third is spiritual outpourings, divine manifestations. Uh, that's going to be, if you asked, you know, interviewed the saints during that time, what was the endowment of power? I think this is what they would refer to. And this would usually come on the heels of doing the ordinances. And then the fourth thing, uh, super crucial, kind of the climax of the endowment, is the restoration of priesthood keys there on uh, about a week later from the dedication day. So that is very different than what we normally think of as endowment. So when you use section 109 and you're going to teach 109, it's going to talk about the endowment, endowment, and stuff like that. Just remember that that's very different. I would use section 109 to promise people about the endowment that will happen to them when they go to the temple today. That would be very out of context, and that's not what the Lord was talking about when he was talking to those saints. You can talk about going to the endowment today, but just... I wouldn't use those verses, right? You can talk about the blessings that the prophets have subsequently talked about the modern endowment, but I wouldn't equate it with what the Lord's speaking of in section 109 exactly. Obviously, in principle, there's some overlap, right? Uh, so let's look first at the spiritual outpourings and divine manifestations. Boy, if you wanted to just go on a little historical field trip and be transported in time to any time period in church history, I would do just from January to April, of 1836. That would have been fun. So check it out. Let's just outline this. Uh, so here are some of the spiritual outpourings that occurred. You can go read up on all this. It's uh, all on my website under Kirtland and Kirtland Endowment. You can read all the first-hand accounts. I'll just give you the summary. 
So January, mid-January, Joseph sees the celestial kingdom as recorded in section 137. Solid vision of the twelve, redemption of Zion, angels ministering to some people. The Kirtland temple is filled with the glory of God. Another man saw and envisioned the armies of heaven protecting the saints on the return to Zion. Some saw the face of the Savior. Then, the next day, the twelve, the seventy, and the high council got together. Angels were seen ministering. The gift of tongues fell on them in mighty power. Angels mingled their voices with our angels, with our voices. And it was just it was a pretty sweet choir. Uh, then a few uh, days later, on the 28th, uh, as they're, they continue meeting in the temple, they're not going to dedicate it until March, right? So this is all like pre-dedication stuff. They're meeting in the temple uh, and doing washings and anointings. And one saw a pillar of fire rest upon the heads of Corums. Another saw a mighty angel riding upon a horse of fire with a flaming sword, along with five others protecting the saints from evil spirits. Another saw the Savior upon the cross, and then later crowned with glory above the sun. Joseph saw a vision that day with the brethren. Then, a few days later in February, a week later or so, one saw a vision of the twelve in England doing a great work. Others spoke in tongues and prophesied. Some saw visions of Zion and her glory. Angels came and worshipped with us, and some saw them. Then March, this is dedication day, uh, angels were seen. Uh, Brigham Young gave a short sermon in tongues. David Patton interpreted. A two-month-old baby participates in the Hosanna shout while nursing. The nursing then pulls away from the mom and just starts saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to God in the land, then goes back to nursing. Uh, there's the, 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 the rushing mighty wind. Uh, yeah, uh, where everyone spontaneously arises, and say, like, uh, moved upon by some unseen power. Many then start speaking in tongues, prophesy, uh, cloven tongues of fire, the like Pentecost are actually seen above people's heads, and uh, the temple's filled with angels, pillar of fire resting upon the temple. That's what people said. There's some people on top of the temple. You know, you've heard these stories, right? Uh, just all oh, heaven is breaking loose. This is part of the endowment. This is uh, a devout, a devout, uh, an endowment of power, of divine power. These people are being fortified spiritually in a big way. Uh, then, at the solemn assembly that the Lord said in section 88, one of the main reasons they're building the temple, uh, the Savior appeared to some people. They saw him, which was the promise, if you're pure, you will see the Savior in the solemn assembly. Angels ministered to others. This is just a summary. There's more than this. Uh, I want to zoom in on one of these. Uh, let's go to this January 21st one which is DNC 137, so out of historical context, yeah? Uh, in terms of where it's placed here. Why is it placed as 137, not 108? Should be 108, according to this chronology. Uh, this vision was recorded in the history of the church, but not put in the scriptures until, not Orson Pratt, Orson Pratt doesn't put it in. It's not until like the 1981 edition, I believe, of, this, of the scriptures that Section 137 is added to the Doctrine and Covenants. So very late addition, which means they can't miss the numbers at that point. Everything's solidified, but it happens right here. Here's an example of A, a divine teaching, which occurred during B, anointings, in the form of, this, this teaching came in the form of divine manifestations. So three out of the four components of the endowment. Uh, here's timeline-wise, it happens... Uh, here, during this outpouring, this week of outpourings of spiritual manifestations, um, then there are going to be part. There's going to we're going to have the uh, school of the prophets happening. They're working on the uh, Hebrew and translating Egyptian papyri. They stopped that so that we could do the dedication, which is received and written down the day before the dedication. And then, then the uh, solemn assembly is held on the 30th. Section 110 then happens later on on the on April 3rd, and so. Uh, this actually comes in sequence right before those two. Yeah, yeah, you with me? So let's let's break it down. What goes on? So here they are in the Kirtland Temple. Up at the very top, these were rooms that were uh, dedicated for the school of the prophets. So you have school rooms and you have a quorum room. Or if you look at it from a bird's eye here, school room, school room, school room, quorum room, uh, right there. That's where they were when Section 137 happened. From the outside, it's this window right there. Or if you're looking up, it's like that's the one. Um, this is the room picture from it on the inside. Normally you're not supposed to snap photos inside the Community of Christ's uh, buildings. So you just have to Google them or repent later. Um, just kidding. 
guys, follow the rules, we did, okay? Uh, I got this one, I just Googled it, so there you go, legit. Did on our take tour, they myself. wouldn't. On our tour, they wouldn't even let us go up there. Oh really? Yeah, it was okay. main, main floor. Yeah. Mm. My tour, they let us go up there. What was wrong with your tour? No, it was, were you with like a company or was it with like the? It's just my family, but the tour was massive. Oh. They said the beans huge. on that that top floor are spread out, and so like they can bear less weight, so you have to go in small groups if you go. Uh, that makes sense. That was the just that's what they said to us. Section 137, what happens? Joseph says that his father poured holy uh, oil on him, uh, anointing oil, uh, anoints his head, lays his hand on his head. Uh, in fact, uh, I didn't put that in the PowerPoint. Should we read his words? They're really powerful, actually. Uh, section 137 is an excerpt from this history. Let me just show you where I would go. Um, so... I go to so section 109, if you just go there on the website, spiritual manifestations before, during, and after the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. Just click on that. Visions of Wednesday, January 21st, is where section 137 comes from. So uh, we won't read the whole thing, but let's kind of skim and see what happens here. It was early candlelight, so an evening, early evening. He meets in the West School Room in the temple to attend the ordinance of anointing our heads with holy oil. Also, the councils of Kirtland and Zion met in the two adjoining rooms. They're waiting in prayer. Um, we then laid our hands upon aged Father Smith, invoked the blessings of heaven on him. I then anointed his head and consecrated with consecrated oil, sealed many blessings upon him. The presidency then took turns, laying their hands on Joseph Smith Sr., blessing him, um, beginning at the oldest until they had all laid their hands and pronounced blessings. Um, the presidency then took seat in their turn according to age, beginning the oldest, and received their anointing and blessing under the hands of Father Smith, senior. Now he blesses them back. And in my turn, my father anointed my head and sealed upon me the blessings of Moses to lead Israel in the latter days, even as Moses led him in days of old. Also the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All the presidency laid their hands upon me and pronounced upon my head many prophecies and blessings, many of which I shall not notice at this time. But as Paul said, so say I, let us come to visions and revelations. The heavens were open to us, but then I saw the celestial kingdom. And now you'll recognize the language in 137. So it's in the, right in the midst of all this anointing and blessing and anointing and blessing. And then I saw the celestial kingdom. Let's turn to it. Uh, it's just an excerpt, but you get the idea. This is a divine teaching. This is part of the endowment that came in the midst of doing holy ordinances that came through a vision, a heavenly manifestation. And uh, he says that he sees the celestial kingdom. He sees, he cannot tell if he's in his body or out of his body, right? Uh, he sees, he, he describes the gate, he describes the, the streets paved with, glo with gold, the throne of God, Father Adam and Abraham. And then who's he surprised to see? Oh, Alvin. Alvin. He sees my father and my mother, who at that time were still alive. And then he sees his brother Alvin, that has long since slept. And as he starts to wonder about that, then he gets divine teaching. Right? So he thinks he hasn't been baptized yet. Then the teaching comes in verse 7. All who have died without a knowledge of this gospel, who would have received it if they had been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. He doesn't mention anything yet about work for the dead. That will come in, uh, in Nauvoo. Um, so he does not talk about how these guys can become an heir uh, after they die if they haven't received it, but he just says that they, they will. If they would have received it, they'll be heirs. Uh, verse 8, those who die without a knowledge will receive it, will be heirs. Then he thinks about children, and children, he's taught about children uh, that, who die before the age of accountability. So some core doctrine that we, uh, we, we teach today uh, finds its roots in a vision that Joseph had while in the Kirtland Temple receiving anointings of oil uh, under the hands of his father and all of the uh, presidency. Uh, does he say and the twelve? Uh, anyway, so uh, it's in the midst of that. It's actually There's actually more to it than that. He actually goes on to say that's not included in this. He sees a vision of the twelve apostles of the Lamb going forth, uh, ministering in foreign lands, standing together in a circle. Uh, he saw them with their clothes all tattered and feet swollen, their eyes cast downward, and Jesus standing in their midst, but they didn't recognize Jesus. 
the Savior was looking at them and weeping. He sees Elder William McClellan in the south standing up and preaching. He sees Brigham Young. Uh, so he's like just having this incredible uh, spiritual experience. That, I think, is a really good example of what the Kirtland Endowment is. Does this make sense? Um, that's what they were preparing for. That's what they were sanctifying themselves for. This is finally, uh, it's now happening as the Lord had promised. This is the endowment of literal like, power. The power of godliness is being manifest through the ordinances of the priesthood. Father of the brethren, Receive the ordinance, and then they start start seeing visions as also angels minister. And you should read all this. It's really good stuff. Oliver Cowdery, much shorter account. He just writes, The glorious scene is too great to be described in this book. Therefore, I only say that the heavens were open to many, and great and marvelous things were shown. I like Joseph Smith's account better, do you? <laughs> yeah. um, so you can just look at all those. Those are the spiritual manifestations. Different days when that's all happening. Um... Okay. Very good, very good. Thoughts on 137? Okay. Let's go context of 109. Go back now. So this comes again after 137. What's 139? Or I mean 109. What's this famous to be or uh, famous as? This is the dedicatory, dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple. Uh, worked on by a committee. Worked on by a committee the day before, consisting of like six men who uh, worked on this. Joseph has been working on it for a while. Been studying King Solomon, King Solomon's prayer uh, when he's dedicating the temple there. So you'll see a little bit, a few elements of Solomon's prayer in here. Studying what's existing, counseling with his brethren, talking, they're scribing, trying to get this right. So it's kind of a not a pure like revelation in the sense that there was no forethought. There was a lot of hard homework that went into this. Um, but he'll still say uh, that this prayer, look at the section heading, this prayer was given to him by revelation. So just remember that there's like uh, different on the spectrum of the revelations that Joseph received. Some of them come automatic, no work. Some of them come after a lot of work. This is one of those that came after a lot of work. And maybe a lot of the revelations in the synthesizing and the, uh, putting it together. So it's, it's unclear exactly what he means by revelation. There's no, there was a committee that helped put it together. So, uh, dedication day. Let me walk you through uh, the excitement of this day. Uh, saints assemble at 7 a.m. outside. The doors weren't open yet until 8. About 500 or 600 waiting outside. Donations are accepted to help offset the cost of the temple. If you have anything to donate, appreciate that. Pulpits were then consecrated to the Lord inside, and the doors were opened at 8 a.m. Joseph, City, and Oliver are the ones that were the ushers to help seat the saints as they come in. Ultimately, about 900 to 1,000, Joseph says, saints were seated. A super packed. If you ever sat in any of those benches, they like you get in, and you, like, they close, and you can only fit, I don't know, depending on which one it is, but uh, not very many. If you do the math, and you add those up, and you say that 900 or 1,000, Joseph says, we put in many as could comfortably fit, which is not 100% accurate. I think it would be very uncomfortable. Uh, there's a thousand people in there, but maybe they were smaller back then, okay? Maybe they were smaller. The people were smaller. I don't know. Uh, many saints were still outside. Joseph felt bad about that. He says, hey, why don't you guys go to the schoolhouse nearby and hold a meeting there, which they did. And some, still some people couldn't fit in the schoolhouse. Meeting started at 9 a.m., is where it gets fun. Sidney Rigdon starts out by reading Psalm 96 and 24. Then, there's a song by the choir. Then, Sidney Rigdon prayed. Then, there was another song by the choir. Then, Sidney Rigdon preached uh, on three verses, and he spoke, quote, for two hours and a half in his usual forcible and logical manner. Two and a half hour sermon by Sidney. This is the verses about the foxes have holes in the birds, but the Son of Man has not where to... Oliver Cowdery can't stop talking about this. Uh, that's a quote from Oliver. He says, It was one of the most beautiful, masterful discourses I've ever heard. It moved many people to tears. Let me just tell you about Sidney Rigdon's style. His style was amazing. Like, so, the way he would forcibly, logically build up an argument and that just like... The way he delivered it, uh, I feel bad for those who never got to hear Sidney preach. It was a masterpiece. A masterpiece. Then... Sydney presented, after he's done amen, he's like, now I'd like to present the officers of this, it's 
for kind of the Sydney Rigdon show. I'd like to present the office of the church for a sustaining vote, which he did. The vote was unanimous. Then there was a hymn. Then there was a 15-minute intermission. Then there was an opening hymn. Then Joseph asked for a sustaining vote again. Then Joseph preached a little. Then there was another hymn. Then Joseph offers the dedicatory prayer. <laughs> how, how long are we into this meeting before section 109 is read? A long time. And then what happens? There's another hymn. And then Joseph asked the various quorums if they accept the prayer. Did you accept, did you accept 109? Affirmative. Unanimous. Awesome. Then the sacrament was administered to that congregation. Then Joseph bore his testimony. Then Oliver Cowdery bore his testimony. Then Frederick G. Williams said, I saw an angel come and sit between uh, Oliver and Joseph during the dedicatory prayer. That was awesome. Later on, it was identified as Peter, the apostle, come to accept the dedication. Then Hiram Smith, Smith spoke. Then Sidney Rigdon got up one more time, and he offered some concluding remarks. Woo, that was <laughs> so, the uh, Sidney Rigdon show with a small supporting cast. Uh, <laughs> And then, because Joseph felt so bad that uh, not enough people got to come that would have liked to have been there, they hold another dedication service that evening where they repeat a lot of that uh, again. So, and then there may have been another one. I think there was another one held uh, later. So, uh, anyway, if you wanted to see the dedication of the temple, you got a chance. Kind of like they, uh, they've done that in our day, haven't they? Done multiple times. There you go. Um, very good. Multiple sessions. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. You've been in your stake center. You go to the 9 o'clock, you go to the 11 o'clock, you go to the 1 o'clock dedication. You've seen that. Okay. So, the endowment. Uh, let's look at, we're still talking Kirtland Endowment here. Uh, beautiful prayer. There's not time, obviously, to go through. It's a long prayer. Um, it's a long and uh, involved prayer. Uh, it's a masterpiece. But... Uh, we can't go through all 80 verses. I do just want to pick a theme, and we'll weave through that, and then we'll be done. Is that okay? Um, then we'll do section 110. I would, I would draw attention, especially some of the juicy verses, to these verses, 22 and 26. When we're talking about the endowment of power, what is associated with power uh, in these verses? What are the associated, or His name. what is the associated? What is the name? It is the name. The name, the name of Christ, right? Uh, when you leave this house, you'll be armed with power. And that thy name may be upon them. Father, please arm them with power, that thy name may be upon them. Okay, good. 26. When you leave this house, we, we pray that no combination of wickedness shall have power to rise up and prevail over the people upon whom thy name shall be put in this house. Uh, that the, the name of the Lord is actually referred to 18 times in this prayer. I'll let you have the joy of going finding all those. Not too hard. Um, the temple is dedicated to His name. Um, and that's very interesting. interesting. We just saw in section 107, the apostles are called to be special witnesses of His name. Um, what's going on with the name? And how is that associated with power? What is this? What is this? Armed with power when you get the name of Jesus on you. Uh, you'll notice the name of Christ is associated uh, with all three of these, correct? You covenant to take upon yourself His name. You witness that you're willing to take upon yourself His name. Elder Bednar says that, uh, notice really carefully, Elder Bednar gets this from Elder Oaks, but he says, notice that when you take the sacrament, you only witness that you're willing to take upon yourself the name of, the, of Christ. Then he asks, where do you actually take upon yourself the name? And the answer is? Temple. In the temple, because that's where my name is put. His name is there. You go to the temple to get the name of Christ. Every time you take the sacrament, you're promising to qualify for the uh, promises, the blessings of the temple. Uh, in section 110, you'll notice that uh, the Savior, so go to section 110 with me. So this was at a sacrament meeting uh, on a Sabbath. April 3rd was the Sabbath. They, there's a veil of the temple. You hear about the veil of the temple, but you can never really see it inside of these kind of pictures. But the veil is this like, canvas up at the top. They would drop the veil of the temple, and then you could like compartmentalize that room into a bunch of different compartments. This one is a drop down. Would let the, those pulpits there, the Melchizedek priesthood pulpits, be kind of secluded. Joseph said that they knelt there uh, and uh, prayed to the Lord. And that's when section 110 happens, when the Savior appears to Oliver and Joseph 
right there uh, at the pulpit. And they see and he describes the Savior. But I just want to draw your attention to the point about his name. Verse 6 and 7, notice that the Savior says, Let your hearts, let the hearts of your brother rejoice, and let the hearts of all my people rejoice, who have with their might built this house to my name. There it is again. For behold, I have accepted this house, and my name shall be here. And I will manifest myself to my people in mercy in this house. So when we talk about a temple, and we teach about a temple, uh, the very first temple of this dispensation uh, makes a big deal about the name. If you go back and listen to uh, in Kings when Solomon is praying in the dedicatory prayer of the temple of Solomon, same thing. The name of the Lord is going to be put upon the people when they go into that house. Uh, when do you actually take upon yourself the name of Christ? You say, well, in the temple. Well, when in the temple do you take upon yourself the name of Christ? Ponder that. Uh, Elder Oaks suggests this. He says, when the Lord declared that his name would be in the Kirtland temple, he immediately showed at least one meaning of that declaration by having his delegated servants then confer the priesthood keys under which his authority would be exercised there. So Elder Oaks make an association between the name of Christ and the keys of authority that are uh, exercised in that house. All of the keys that are about to be revealed in section 110 are relevant to the house of God and they're exercised therein cumulatively perhaps when all three are turned in your behalf is when you take upon yourself the name of Christ. That's a fascinating thought. Fascinating thought. Um, yeah. So, did we do justice to section 109? Say no. <laughs> Heck no, right? That's, but there's there's so many so many sweet things in this one. Uh, but uh, I like to emphasize, if, I, if I'm constrained on time, then I like to go right to the heart of this. What's this name business? What does it mean that you actually have power uh, when you receive the name of Christ? And how do you receive the name of Christ? And what are we actually saying in the sacrament when we say we're willing to take upon ourselves the name of Christ? Uh, how's that connected to the temple? Doesn't that kind of mean we're willing to do what's necessary to enter the temple? Couldn't that be another meaning of that? Exactly, yeah. That's what the Bender says. Yeah, he, okay. says, he says, taking upon yourself the name of Christ commences in the waters of baptism, but it doesn't, yeah. it's not fulfilled okay. until the tempest kind of makes that bridge. So it's part of our baptismal covenant? Mm -hmm. So basically, when you're baptized, that looks immediately to the temple. Yeah. When you take the sacrament, you're looking immediately to the temple. Mm -hmm. It's the crown, it's the capstone of everything that we do, right? Yeah. It's the temple. So, uh, let's talk restoration of keys here. Um, that's the fourth part of the endowment. The fourth part of the endowment. So, President Joseph Fielding Smith, he says that's basically the purpose of the Kirtland Temple. It was basically built for the restoration of keys. In the receiving of these keys, the fullness of gospel ordinances is revealed. Name the three people who delivered the keys. Ready to go? Uh, Moses. Moses comes, uh, then Elias, Elias then Elijah. Elijah, right? Moses, Elias, Elijah. Uh, and then, uh, so that's that's fair enough. What does uh, Moses bring back? What does Elias bring back? What does Elijah bring back? Let me give you a little quiz before you answer. Um, what was restored? Your your options are A, B, C, or D. Okay. Who restored it? The keys authorizing the celestial marriage covenant in which the promises made to the fathers are extended to couples. Yes. C is incorrect. No way. How about it's not D. None of the above. Mm -hmm. That's D. B. Okay. <laughs> this is not D. The answer is, yes. that is a B. We're going to talk about that in a second. Number two, the keys of missionary work. Moses. The correct answer is Moses. D. Yes. Yeah, D. Okay. Uh, yeah, we. All right. Well, I'll talk about this more. Okay. Uh, three, the keys of gathering to and building full fledged ah, temples. Moses. Moses. Moses uh, four, the keys of uh, authorizing the binding together of the whole human family into God's family. C. C, Elijah. Five, the keys which ultimately make all the ordinances eternally binding. C. C, C Elijah. Uh, six, the keys which conceal a person or couple up unto eternal life. D. C. Oh, well, dang C, it. Elijah. Oh, huh. yeah, we got, some, we got a little bit of work to do. Okay, so true or false? Let's do true or false. 50 50 chance here. Uh, the three keys restored in the Kirtland Temple align perfectly with the threefold mission of the church, proclaiming the gospel, perfecting the saints, and redeeming the dead. 
pulse. Just like that. Say pulse. We've got one pulse. Anyone else? I'll say true. I've been, say true. I've been wrong one. Contrarian. Okay. There's a fourth mission now. What about the poor? Oh shoot, man. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this is. Uh, if you want to think about it like this, you can. It's just that that's not right. Okay. Uh, so uh, I remember being in a meeting, Jeff, next to you. Uh, we saw in some unnamed meeting that we were in at some unnamed time. There was some unnamed mission president in some area somewhere that uh, was going off about this and he basically drew this on the board but he did a really, uh, it, was, it was bad. He's like, I have the keys of Moses. The state president has the keys of Elias and the temple president has the keys of Elijah. And I was like dying, I don't know if you remember. I was like, oh, no, but you don't want to have a meeting like that and be like, President, that's uh, incorrect. But um, I would like, you, you guys are church educators, correct? So can we teach it correctly? Please, 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 please. Okay, so here we go. Let me make the case and you can decide whether you disagree. But um, the gathering, just so we can take this at Moses out of proclaiming the gospel, when did proclaiming the gospel begin? Was it 1836 of April 3rd? No. Heavens no. It started when? Much earlier. 1829, as early as section, you can use section 4 if you want, one place, right, where you can start talking about that. Uh, it seems that uh, Aaronic priesthood keys are enough to authorize the preaching of the gospel. Certainly Peter, James, and John, by the time they have come, uh, have restored that. The gathering, the gathering has been commanded ever since section 29, you're, bring, you're called to bring it past the gathering of mine elect, that's 1830. Uh, section 38 is the first time the saints are actually called to gather. That's 30, 31, right there, January 1831. Uh, the gathering begins to Kirtland. Are the keys of the gathering of Israel what Moses brought? If you say yes, then you are suggesting that there has been seven years of illegitimate gospel uh, preaching and gathering happening. Just know that where you, what, you're, what mess you're getting into. You're saying that, with that, that we've been not doing that with those keys for seven years. And finally, when he showed up, now we were, we're doing that in an authorized way. Ugh, just be careful. Right? What was Moses? Usually the, piece, the person that brings back the keys is like the essence of what he's bringing back. He's like the poster child of what he's bringing back. True or false, Moses was the quintessential missionary. He's known for being a missionary. His missionary work, the way he no. proclaimed the gospel. No. Is that what Moses did? No. No. What is Moses famous for? What did he do that no one else had done prior to him? Deliverance. Yeah. He, <laughs> he, he built a temple. He is the very first one ever to build a temple. So the Makakia, listen to how the language is, because it's confusing. Understandably, it says that he brings back the keys of the gathering of Israel from the four parts of the earth. Sounds like missionary work in gathering Israel, right? But uh, it's temple-based, so listen to this. Moses, who in the majesty of the Melchizedek priest had led enslaved Israel out of Egyptian bondage into their promise in Palestine, brings back those very keys. These keys empower those who hold them to lead all Israel, the ten tribes included, from all the nations of the earth to the mountains of the Lord's houses, there to be endowed with power from on high. So it's the particularly uh, authorizing the kind of temples they're going to build in Nauvoo to gather Israel to those kind of temples, to build those kind of temples. The kind of temple that Moses was commanded to build, the tabernacle was a Melchizedek priesthood temple. The Kirtland temple is not that. The Kirtland temple is a preparatory temple so that we can get the keys, so that we can build the kind of temples that we want to build, the kind that we build in Nauvoo. <laughs> so this is like the this is the authorization to bring Israel together in a way that we build a temple. That's what Moses did. That's what he's famous for. That's what he's quintessentially like qualified for and known for in the scriptures. Right? There's never a temple before Moses. Tabernacle is the very first one ever. Right. Uh, okay, true or false? The three keys restored in the Kirtland Temple all pertain specifically to the temple and temple work. They are all about the temple. True or false? Let's see, yes. yes. This is like so true. This is what I would teach. This is what I would, what I would teach. So Moses authorizes the gathering together to build temples. What's Elias bringing back that's very temple y? Let's look in verse 12. After this, Elias appeared and committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham, saying that in us and our seed, all generations after us should be blessed. What's that? 
was the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham. He's going to bring the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what this is. What are those given to a person? Or a couple? Oh, married. And this is at the marriage moment, right? This is, hmm. So he's bringing the, the, the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham is the, is the, is the ordinances that authorize uh, the promises of the fathers, promises made to the fathers, to use section 2's language, to be then promised to a couple in the temple. So he authorizes that. So this one's temple marriage? That's right. That's temple marriage. Whoa. That's when the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are given. Mm -hmm. Then Elijah comes, and Elijah, uh, the only way it's mentioned here is he brings back this, uh, well, this is more like a story, right? He says that he's Elijah, and there's a dash or the one spoken of by Malachi, dash in verse 14, testifying that he should be sent before the great and dreadful day of the Lord come. Uh, meaning Malachi, when Malachi talked about this, Malachi said that he would, that he, I, Elijah, would come to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the children to the fathers, lest the whole earth be smitten with a curse. Therefore, the keys of this dispensation, the word dispensationary trips us up because we think like a period of time in which the gospels were stored on the earth. That's not the way he's using the word. In this, in this uh, meaning, in fact, I, I got the dictionary on this one just to make sure we got it right. So, dispensation, when you use it like that, means, hold on, let me pull it up. A system of principles and rites or rituals. A dispensation in the 1820 dictionary means like a system of principles and rites and ordinances. So, Elias appears and commits the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham or the system of principles and rituals associated with the Abrahamic covenant. Um, and then Elder McConkie confirms that's celestial marriage. Marriage discipline of Abraham. So when you are able to kneel at that altar, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that kind of language, right? The blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob now here. We call that man a temple sealer. Is that inappropriate? No. But is he using the keys of Elijah or Elias? Elias. Elias, right. He's not unconditionally able to seal anyone up to eternal life. This is all conditional. Right. Then Elijah comes. So the keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands. What dispensation? The, the dispensation to turn the hearts of the children. Or let's say it like this. The, the, the rites and rituals necessary to help turn, or Joseph says seal, the hearts of the fathers to the children, children to the fathers, to link the human family together into the grand family of God. Right? That's the, what dispensation means in this context. Yeah. If I understand right, some of the scriptures, like I think it's Book of Mormon and Malachi, it says Elijah will be the hearts of fathers, children, children to fathers. And then New Testament, and I think D and C says Elias, right? Am I mixed up? Mm -hmm. That's right. So, yeah, the New Testament uses Elias as a title, or it's, well, it's just the Greek version of Elijah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they're two different people, but right. Jesus just used the word Elias yeah. referring to Elijah. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's all Elijah. It's all Elijah that's doing the hearts of fathers and children. That's right. Yeah. Okay. The New Testament says Elias will do that. That's just the Greek version of Elijah. That's okay. Right. Yeah. Good. Good. Any other questions at this book to this point? Just, just for the record, there's precedence of calling someone whose first name is not Elijah, Elijah. Yeah. Jesus calls John, John the Baptist. Yeah. He's like, you are Elijah. Yeah. So in that sense, it becomes like it's yeah. title. Title. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um. This okay. is gonna be dumb. I gotta get this out of here. Sorry. Get it. I'm gonna get the class done here. So who, who was Elias? And Elijah knows he's taken up to heaven in the world with right? Okay. Who's Elias? How's he different from Elijah? That's not a dumb question. Uh, Elias, there's like a bunch of debate on it. I'll just show you the debate. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's officially not a dumb question. Sweet. So, let's see. I'm laughing on the inside. <laughs> Uh, Kirtland, I'm trying to remember where I've been and put that thing. Probably be a good idea to have put it with section one too. What website is this? Uh, it's got one there. It's got one that's Googling. I think you uh, know this website pretty well. 
I think I put it with one thing, didn't I? Yeah. Keys restored in curling. Who is Elias? Huh, that's a good question. Uh, President Packer says there's three definitions. Elias equals Elijah. Talked about that. Elias also equals Elias. <laughs> uh, which, which in those cases it's talking about a particular man, a prophet that we don't know anything about, but he existed. Third, Elias can mean a messenger. In the Kirtland Temple, Elias, President Packer's opinion, is it's the Elias, the man Elias. I say it's his opinion because it's contradicted by other, as we go along here. Elder McConkie says, we don't know who he was in mortality. There's some thoughts that think it might have been Noah. Others think it may have been Abraham himself. John A. Witzel kind of puts these all together. He's like, some say one, some say another. Uh, right, there's, there's Noah. Some, some say John the Baptist. The Bible says that it was the angel Gabriel who visited Zacharias. Joseph Smith said Gabriel is Noah. These students of the scriptures conclude, therefore, that Elias is another name or title for Noah. This inference may or may not be correct. The name Gabriel may be borne by more than one personage, or may be a title, as is the case of Elias. When Elias the man lived, and what he did on this life must for the present remain in the field of conjecture. Esoteric. Esoteric. <laughs> yeah, as far as that goes, yeah. Was he actually somebody that came? He was. <laughs> that's, all we, that's all we can say with it. Rock solid certainty. So actually, super good question. Super good question. Thanks. All right. Uh, let's see what else we want to do here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. How are we doing? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm trying to. So Elias and Elijah. The difference between the keys is marriage versus like children. So like horizontal versus vertical ceiling, is that what it is like? Uh, yeah, so let's, let's walk through this. So, so let's talk about that. But can we go to this case and then we'll cover that question. So uh, I have proposed to you that every key that was restored, every priesthood, every ounce of priesthood is associated with the temple somehow. Right. That from John the Baptist, to Peter, James, and John, the apostleship and keys of the kingdom, to the voice of God, uh, authorizing them to confer the Holy Ghost, etc. Uh, organization of the church, that's not priesthood, but then you got the June 1st conference of 1831, when the Holy Order and the Melchizedek priesthood was restored there. All the way up here now to uh, Moses, Elias, and Elijah. But all of this was like preparatory for uh, the Nauvoo Temple, that the keys that were restored in Kirtland, so Moses' keys would then authorize Israel to gather to build the temple, so that now they're justified in building the Nauvoo Temple. Uh, Elias' keys are going to make possible the uh, promises made to the fathers to be extended to new couples. Elijah's keys are going to then uh, enable all of those ordinances, uh, in particular the marriage ordinance we want to key in on, to then be sealed and make it forever. Um, the Lord said, Therein, meaning in the Nauvoo Temple, speaking in section 124, Therein are the keys of the Holy Priesthood ordained. All of the keys of the Priesthood are ordained for the Holy Temple, that you may have honor and glory. Um, you remember we've talked through these different, these, these different keys. This is the last part of what I would say is the restoration of priesthood. And I would say it like this, that Elias' keys authorize celestial marriage in which those promises are made. Elijah's keys authorize the binding together of the human family, which would include the binding together and sealing up unto eternal life of husband and wife. Uh, those keys that, he is, that, that Elijah is restoring makes every other ordinance like binding forever. Uh, section 132 talks about it as uh, in this way, verse 7 of section 132, if you want to make a note. Um, he, the Lord says, All covenants... All contracts, bonds, obligations, oaths, vows, and performance, anything, anything that's not sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise of Him who is anointed for time and for all eternity must, at the end of verse 7, uh, have an end when men are dead. Every covenant must be sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, uh, let me go to Joseph Smith. He said that the power of Elijah 
It is to hold the keys of the powers and endowments of the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood. The power of Elijah is sufficient to make your calling and election sure. So the man who holds these keys, which verse 7 says, there's always one man on earth at a time who's authorized to exercise them completely. That man uh, can make people's calling and election sure. He can, uh, with those keys, bind all your conditional ordinances and make them now unconditional. All the promises of your baptism all the way up through your marriage are now unconditional uh, when the man with those keys turns them on your behalf. Does this make sense? It also, that sealing of children back to parents, that ordinance, or that being born in the covenant, in the new and everlasting covenant, or in the promises God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, this power makes that binding and official forever when that couple has their calling election made sure of Joseph's time. That's where this business of uh, uh, children of those who are sealed uh, won't fall astray. You know that, you know that yeah. one quote? Um, turns out Joseph was actually talking about a couple who has had their calling and election made sure by the man who holds the keys of Elijah. That will have a great blessing upon their posterity, who, if they do not transgress, Howard Corey has in his notes, uh, will be uh, heir to all the promises of of uh, the father and mother, uh, all the promises of the new and everlasting covenant, which for their parents have been made sure. There's like way more going on with Elijah than it's like in your family history. You know, like this is like this is like the key that's like hard to like wrap our arms around. Like the the, the what Elijah brings back. Like this is the the end of priesthood. When section two says, "I will reveal the priesthood by Elijah," like yeah, like this is the fullness. This is the capstone of all priesthood that there is. And he's going to make all other priesthood ordinances valid and efficacious and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Those keys that he brings back. So is it about family history? Sure, in a way, like, you want to live in such a way that you can have your collection made sure, which then secures your posterity, which then secures you in the grand chain. Prior to that, you're going to do a good job of repenting. We're going to do our very best to... Uh, you know, keeping the commandments and doing our ministry and teaching and uh, doing everything we can. But what we're trying, what we're striving for, and what Joseph was teaching in Nabu was you want to live in such a way that you can have your calling election made sure that the keys of Elijah can be turned on your behalf. For the vast majority of us, that's going to happen after we die, right? probably in the millennial day. So everything we're doing up to prior to those keys being turned in your behalf is preparatory. Everything is preparatory. All the work we're doing in the temple is preparatory. It's always through your faithfulness, through your faithfulness. Everything's through your faithfulness. But when you live in such a way that uh, your faithfulness has been proved and the ancestors, those you're doing the work for, have done so, at some point along the way, uh, then it becomes short through the keys of the light. So, did that make any sense? You say that again. Now, so, <laughs> on April 3rd, <laughs> Any other questions? This is kind of a lot to take in, and I'm, I'm, I would dump this on high school students necessarily. <laughs> I would I would tell them that uh, probably that uh, the keys that Elijah restored are the keys that make all other ordinances official and binding. I've referenced DNC 132 verse 7. So uh, uh, so if you say Elijah has the sealing power, does that mean that's what's invoked at your wedding day? And the answer is no. That's the keys of Elias. So why do we call the guy that does it the sealer? I don't know, that's a good tradition that we have. But uh, he's not actually sealing them, right? It's through their faithfulness, they're still conditional. No keys of Elijah have been turned on their behalf to make their calling election sure. That's Elias' promises happening, Elias' keys being turned, not Elijah' keys yet. So we want to strive for the Elijah experience. But yeah, please. Uh, two questions. Uh, first question, we, we attribute these keys to Moses, Elijah, and Elias. But am I, has every prophet held all those keys? Like Peter, the Apostle, like all the books in the New Testament? Uh, hard to say, right? You can conjecture. So Moses and Elias appear on the Mount of Transfiguration. So did they then get the keys that Moses and Elias had? Peter, James, and John, did they get them at that moment? There's no record of it. You can imply. It's kind of a pre Kirtland, Kirtland moment on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus had promised them the keys of the kingdom and Peter, whatever you seal on earth will be sealed in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then a week later, incidentally, Elijah shows up on Mount Transfiguration, Peter's there, 
and the rest is left to your imagination. So, kind of, I, I think that, that probably is the moment when he got both the keys of the kingdom and the sealing keys of Elijah, so that he could then he could do that. So we have to extrapolate a little, but I don't think that's too far of a stretch. Uh, they, you know, Paul tells us they're doing baptisms for the dead at some point in there. He's like, whoa, I feel like there's a whole history here that's missing. Mm -hmm. So he just like he nods to it, like everyone knows that, but. Why are we then baptized for the dead? We're not getting resurrected, right? He's actually making an argument for resurrection and he uses something that's really common knowledge to the people. Uh, so you have these like glimpses. Right? But, so New Testament church, you could probably feel pretty confident. Old Testament church, maybe less confident that they all held all the keys. Yeah, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. So when two Latter day Saints get married, yeah. they're not sealed. We use that phrase, don't we? We do. We do. <laughs> So, but that is not, I'm just trying to remember so we don't, well, let's see the so we don't, uh, so we stay appropriate. But, you, so you taught this as the keys of temple marriage, not as the keys of temple sealing. You right. taught, right. you taught Eli, Elijah as temple sealing. Right. Binding. Elijah is all the generation. Yeah. Binding everything. Let me, so don't just take my interpretation, I just say go check out what the prophets uh, are teaching. Um, so Joseph Smith by far teaches this the best and everything after him gets sort of uh, uh, like I said it's like such a big doctrine that Joseph teaches about sealing all ordinances, sealing people up to eternal life conduction made sure, children bound through that way, you know, it's like so much to take in that it kind of gets simplified to sealing power, sealing power uh, Hearts turning to children, father to that's like family history work. You know, so it kind of gets funneled down and kind of diluted a little. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say we're like deliberately trying to dumb down any doctrine, but we're just, it is, the keys of Elijah are relevant to family history work for sure, because mm -hmm. those ordinances are going to be worth nothing if Elijah's keys are not turned and eventually to make those binding, right? All the ordinances we do for the dead are all conditional until those keys are turned. So this is like the key that makes it all like eternal. That's Joseph's teaching on that in section 132. You see that in there. So yeah, Elias is bringing back. So if you want to look at that, the, the keys actually stored by him. Elder McConkie is the most clear about that. This is the marriage discipline of Abraham. He says when, when a couple goes into uh, the temple and they get married, uh, they are promised all the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is the moment. So Elias appears, and that's what he's that's what he's giving them. Um, trying to see, yeah, the promise of endless posterity, all of that. Uh, here's a really clear, yeah, this is the best one. The Lord sent Elias and he sent Elijah down here at the bottom. And when Elias came, he brought the gospel of Abraham, the divine commission that God gave Abraham, the marriage discipline that God gave Abraham. Elias restored celestial marriage. And Elijah came and brought the sealing power so that the ordinance would be binding on earth and sealed in heaven. And it takes the ministry of both of them to accomplish the purposes of the Lord. That's good. You can say that about baptism. You can say John the Baptist restored the baptism, but then God sent Elijah to make yeah. it. It takes the ministry of both of them in order it to seems fulfill like both, the both are involved in the in the wedding or in the marriage ceremony. But the last can't be through your faithfulness. That's the oh, I get it. I get it. Yourself. Yeah. So you have to prove yourself first, and then the last takes its binding then effect. It's, then it's binding, that's right. Got it. Yeah. You don't so, want it bound before, and like, that's it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and you haven't proved your faithfulness. Yeah, Ellen McConkie taught that having your connection make sure it grows out of celestial marriage. So you married first, aligned with us, yeah. and then, as you prove yourself true and faithful, then like Jenna can so, seal that. Wow. So I'll feel those keys work together really well. Really well. Yeah. 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 It's all about temple, 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 temple. Yeah, it's, it's cool. Gathering to building. I might have been overkill on all that. Um, I just recognized. Well, I didn't, I didn't understand that for most of my teaching career. And I wish I could have, you know, some way to make that relevant to the teenagers too, and those students that we teach to say, what's happening in in Kirtland Temple? It took a temple to get those keys back because they were all about the temple, and every temple that you will ever enter into uh, is authorized because those were brought back. How would your life be different if the Kirtland uh, keys were not restored? Uh, Moroni said the entire earth would be utterly wasted. 
if April 3rd, 1836 doesn't happen, then the Earth is utterly wasted. Like the point of, of the purpose of its creation is now nullified because God wants to get us all into that covenant family, bound and sealed together right, with those that we love. And uh, so this is like, if we're going to make another Mormon holiday, I highly recommend April 3rd becomes the holiday we celebrate. Like this changes the world, you know. <laughs> Stefan would argue for Book of Mormon birthday, September 22nd, correct? Maybe we should celebrate September 22nd and April 3rd. Like th these are like earth-changing days. We celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Come on. Why not? <laughs> why not to uh, get National some, Donut Day? Something with this kind of significance uh, more on the forefront of our minds. So, uh, at BYU, I have my students write a paper <laughs> about the Kirtland Keys. It's like, how would your life be different without the Kirtland Keys? Just kind of explore that. As we think about what happened, the significance of this in the moment, I don't think Joseph could have fully grasped the full significance of this. It's not until Nauvoo that it starts to be fully impact and then he starts to teach the full implications of it. So, uh, yeah, 1836, April 3rd, uh, is a game changer. Uh, I just saw last week, I was in the Salt Lake Cemetery, just walking around with my kids it's in Salt Lake Cemetery. We walked past a, a grave of John Tanner, the one we've talked about in this class. The one who had his leg healed, and then he had all this money. Not a day too soon did he come to Joseph and say, here's the money for the, to help pay off your debts. One of those debts was the Kirtland Temple. Um, the implication of the Kirtland Temple is the Kirtland Keys. The implication of the Kirtland Keys is, is that I get to have my family forever. So I'm standing there in front of John Tanner's grave and with my son. I just told him just that just brief, brief, briefest version of that. Just uh, how grateful I am that John Tanner sacrificed so that our family could be together forever. I don't think he knew he was doing that. I don't think Joseph fully understood when it was happening. But that's God's big plan ever since Joseph was 17, hovering angel in his bedroom. Like, this is what God has been trying to do. This is what he's building to. So now the keys are in place, but the plan will not unfold fully till now. Uh, I testify that those keys are like, real. They're legit. They're actually held today by living apostles of God. Not the original 12, they didn't hold them yet. They still have to be proven. Then in Nauvoo they get them. Never after that, they're given on ordination day. Um, they hold them, and that's my testimony. And therefore, we can have our families forever and be part of the family of God forever. And that's what matters. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Right. Thanks, friends.